Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, if you are in the UK, like Claire McIntosh, our author. Today is publication day for her beautiful book, The Last Party, which starts a series, which is the first thing for Claire, which we'll be talking about. Anyway, Ian is showing a copy. It's our British Crime Club selection of the month. So most of our copies have sold, but happily, we can reorder them. Um, and we did get a few signed copies from the UK, but um, I think we sold them out, didn't we? Yeah, I think so. So good job, Claire. You've done really well so far, miles to go. Anyway, Ian is going to be moderating um, the Facebook and YouTube. So if you have any questions or comments you would like to make, uh, put them in the comments field and Ian will reappear when I click my fingers magically sometime in the hour, and he will relay them to us. So thanks, Ian, very much. Well, Claire, a toast to you. I'm drinking tea because it's just way too early to be drinking. <laughs> I, well, do you know what? I, I'm drinking hot chocolate um, because I read that uh, dark hot chocolate is a kind of, uh, uh, gives your brain a big um, something shot. Uh, and I figured it's better for me than alcohol, so... <laughs> Well, I'm not surprised. Actually, there's so much sugar in it, it'll probably get you through the hour without caffeine. So probably. And it's not too late. It's only nine o'clock here, so it's not bad. No, that is true. Although, you know, we're kind of a rut with British authors who seem to prefer eight o'clock your time. Um, and we've just gone off daylight. I know that's a confusing thing for everybody because Arizona actually doesn't go off daylight. The rest of the world goes on it. We stay the same. Um, and that means that it Part of the year we're eight hours away from the UK, and part of the year we're seven hours. I did not know that. Every That's day nice. is a school day with you, Barbara. It is. I know. Well, it's just weird, Arizona. I'm. I live in fear that we're going to go on a national daylight savings time. I wish that we would go on a national regular time because it's so hot here. You don't really want the extra hour. You know, at night, you, you want it to cool off and it's nicer in the morning, but so it is. Anyway, um, Claire is a really wonderful background for writing The Last Party in that she was a serving police officer and it's a police procedural, which is one of my favorite forms of crime fiction. But also she's moved to Wales so she can write about, about Wales and its interesting back and forthness with Britain. So Claire, I first knew about all this with Ellis Peters, because if you remember, or I don't know if you ever read the Brother Gadville mysteries, but they were set in Shrewsbury, where there was the English gate and the Welsh gate. Yes. And yes, of course. It was I, all I, ne I never read I never read them, but they were at a, they were adapted for TV, um, really famous um series. And yes, of course, I'd forgotten that interplay between the two countries. Yeah, he did. Um, I mean, Ellis, she did. Her real name was Edith Pargeter, and she'd actually written some plain mysteries, not historical mysteries, but contemporary mysteries that also had um, a lot of Welsh in it. And she lived in Shrewsbury nearly all her life, and I've been to visit her several times. But more recently, there's an author you may have run into named Phil Rickman, who also has set a lot of books on the Welsh-English you know, border, but he's had some supernatural elements in his. They certainly are not police procedurals, um, but they had some very fanciful, should I say? Maybe that's the right word. But I'm really, I'm really fond of him. And my friend Diana Gabaldon is a big Phil Rickman reader. And it's been a while since I've talked to him, but I think, I think you're in a wonderful part of um, what is still the United Kingdom, though God knows for how much longer, um, <laughs> in that, you know, you've got, you've got, um, this kind of misty cross-border, you know, historically rich, controversy rich, jurisdictionally complicated place. It is, it is rich territory, both geographically, topographically and, uh, and socially to write about. And I, uh, so I'm not Welsh, we've lived here for six years and we moved from England to a part of Wales, which is Welsh speaking, so my children, who at the time were nine, eight and eight, um, were uh, suddenly put in a school where every lesson was delivered in Welsh. And so they had to become fluent in Welsh very, very quickly. And now they're bilingual. Um, I'm a, a Welsh language learner, so I, I speak Welsh, although not, uh, not fluently yet. Um, but we're very much incomers. And I was really interested in 
how that feels from both sides, how it feels from uh, a small community to have people coming, you know, in and judging you and, and you know, making assumptions about you and also how it feels as the, the person who's coming in. Um, and uh, the, there's a big lake in the town where I live and I swim there quite often and particularly swim there on New Year's Day, which is something of a tradition. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, so yeah, 2020, I was by the edge of the lake on New Year's Day, waiting with all my friends to go into to the lake, um, into the freezing water for this traditional uh, New Year's Day swim. And everyone was talking about how beautiful it was, the you know the mist on the surface of the water and the mountains, and it and it and it was. But I wasn't thinking how beautiful it was. I was thinking, what if a body floated through the water? Because that's what we do isn't it you know people who write crime or read crime we don't go for nice dog walks through the woods and think about the colors of the autumn leaves we think about where the body might be buried and how decomposed it is and what forensics they'd get out of it so that was kind of the starting point for the last party and a brilliant one it was i grew up in chicago where the polar bear plunge was indeed part of winter activities i i doubt if the lake in wales is really as cold as lake michigan no the- it won't be so I've, I've swum in lake michigan but gosh when did i go um april may time i think and there wasn't anyone swimming there and i ran from my hotel in so when i travel i, I try and swim whenever i can so I wear a, I take a tri suit with me because, you know, it's like um, kind of an all in one shorts and T-shirt. So it kind of looks like it's you could just run. But if you go in a swimming pool, it's kind of fine, multi-purpose. And so I ran from my hotel to check out the lake, which feels it, it's mind blowing, isn't it? Because it feels like it should be the sea. It's so huge. You, you can't see anything across it. And so it was messing with my head a bit and it was really cold and quite stormy and rainy and um anyway I just took my trainers off and went in for a quick swim and when I got back and the doorman said guys is it really raining that much I was like no I've just been for a swim and I don't think he believed me anyway it was lovely so no it's not quite that cold um but you know it's it's pretty cold in the winter and also scenic so that you know you Part of what you're writing about is not just the incomer thing, but the fact that there is a luxury home development on the British side of the lake, uh, which is an object of probably both envy and resentment from the Welsh living on the other side of the lake. And we see that here, you know, often in um, where development has happened in places like Aspen or, you know, ski resorts or Lake Tahoe or whatever it is where rich people come in and put down, um, you know, homes out of the reach of the people who normally live there. And in point of fact, after a while, they can drive out up the price of property to the point that the people who live there and the people who would in fact be working and servicing all these fancy homes can't afford to live there. There's a a, um, place like that called Crested Butte in Colorado, Claire, in which they finally she, I mean, realizing that the housing and labor shortage was so acute for all the luxury resorts, they bought a few of them and turned them into affordable housing for, you know, for workers, because um, otherwise the whole place would kind of collapse. Yeah, that's, that's good thinking. The, the, this is happening a lot in, in the UK, in the more touristy areas. So Devon and Cornwall are, are really suffering. Um, and North Wales out on um, what's called the Llyn Peninsula, so a little bit further um, out towards the coast from where I am. Very, very beautiful part of the, the coastline. And it is so expensive now because of all the people who have bought second homes there, turned them into these. I mean, they're incredible homes, but they're worth millions. And now, yeah, people can't afford to live and work there. And so people who have you know, lived there for generations, their children are having to leave because they can't possibly buy a home there. And that fuels a lot of resentment, um, quite rightly, probably, you know, from the locals. Um, and that's a lot of what is happening in in the last party is this, this resentment that 
actually, if you're going to come back, because the founder of um, uh, of the shore, this luxury development in the last party, is, of course, from the village. So the village of Kumkoid, which is on the Welsh side of the lake, um, created this uh, th- this um, this singer, this celebrity, this this homegrown celebrity, uh, Fries Lloyd, who went off to London, having been spotted at a, a music festival in North Wales and made his kind of name on the West End stage. And his, his fortunes have, have dipped a little bit since those heady days. But nevertheless, he's made some money and he's come back to the area. But instead of putting it on the Welsh side, you know, his community, the people who supported him, championed him, he's put it on the English side in this uh, luxury resort. And that um, has caused a lot of problems. Was there an obvious reason for him to put a geographical reason for him to put it on the English side? He owned the land. So historically, long, long time ago, the border, and this is this is where fact and fiction merges a bit. So there is no place that I've found where a geographical border runs through a body of water, um, you know, in, in Wales. Uh, but this is what we've got in the last party. We've got a lake called uh, Llindrych, which means mirror lake. And the border between England and Wales runs right through the middle of this lake. Uh, but originally, sort of, I don't know, 200 years ago, I think maybe even further back than that in the 1600s, I think, there was a big border shake up in the UK and borders were moved kind of arbitrarily. Um, and so the background to this piece of land is that it it was once in Wales and it was owned, um, eventually then owned by Rhys's father. And it then, um, the rights to that land passed to Rhys. And so he was able to do what he wanted with it. And what he did was, was find a financial backer and build this lovely, beautiful luxury resort, which he kind of at one point had the idea that it would be sort of, they'd attract creatives, artists, people, you know, like-minded people who would um, uh, uh, create the right atmosphere. Um, The problem of course with artists is that they often don't have very much money. And so actually what's happened is this resort is populated by investment bankers and, uh, you know, fairly odious rich people. Well, that's upping the tension between the people on the Welsh side who are not Welsh, rich, exactly. and um, upping their resentment. So in order to make a police procedural work, you have to actually construct, create actual police people. Um, and so you've got, you've got two really interesting characters, one of whom is Welsh and one of whom is English, and you bring them together in a pretty spectacular way. So I want to tell us about that, because that's how the book starts. It is, but you know, I don't know if I want to talk about how they meet because I love it so much. And it was kind of the start of of the book. You know, once I the thing about this book is it it evolved in a way that my other books haven't. So every one of my other books has started with a concept, a question, a you know, you're a flight attendant on a a long haul flight and you have to choose between your passengers and, and your family. Um, And this didn't, this started with the setting, it started with the lake and the geography and then with a character. So it was very, very different. And when I met Fionn, because that's kind of how it felt, Detective Constable Fionn Morgan, who's a Welsh detective who's lived in Concoid all her life, pretty much. And she meets her um, English counterpart, uh, I could see exactly how they met, but I loved writing it so much. It made me laugh, you know, it made me laugh as I was it was typing it. And I'd quite like readers to enjoy it as well. So I'm not going to give any more details about that little bit, but they do end up working together and they are opposites in, in many ways, you know, in, in some very obvious ways in that he's male and she's female. Uh, he's black, she's white. She's Welsh, she's English, um, lots of, of very sort of concrete ways, but also in their characters that um, Leo is quite straight down the line. He will, you know, take orders, he'll do his job uh, uh, according to the regulations, whereas Fionn is uh, just an absolute nightmare, to be honest. She um, hates authority, she doesn't really like people very much. Um, 
doesn't really follow the rules unless she agrees with them. Um, she gets very frustrated that Leo doesn't have a, enough backbone, but you know she's she's got more more than enough backbone for both of them. So they complement each other, but they are very different and somewhat antagonistic as the consequence because they don't see the world the same way. So the you know the nearest English city is what Chester. Yeah, yeah. So Chester would be in this fictional setting. Um, I guess about an hour away, something like that, right. which is coincidentally the same distance it is from my town. <laughs> right. Well, no, it makes sense. I mean, I, I say that because, you know, for Americans, I mean, I often tell people, I'm sure I've mentioned it to you, you can fit the entire British Isle into Arizona. So, um, you know, for us, distance is a, is a whole different thing. However, no, and do you know, when I uh, I was on tour in the States when we were moving from England to Wales and I was quite stressed about it all because it was it's about three hours from my mum's house to our new house, um, as was then. And that was a really, really long way. I'd always lived within half an hour of my mum. And and I remember telling somebody, some, you know, a, I don't know, a bookseller or a, a book blogger or somebody and saying, you know, I'm moving a really long way away. It's It's three hours. And she just laughed because she was like, you know, three hours, we go there for lunch, you know. Um, True. So, yes, it, it is. It is strange. But the, within the kind of the experiences of the characters in this book, they are living in a very sort of remote part of yeah. the world where um, from a police point of view, resources are very low. The nearest police station would be sort of 45 minutes to, to an hour away. And so that's the distance you're traveling with a prisoner in the back of the van, for example, or to, you know, to, to go to interview. It's very, very different to working in an urban area where everything is at your fingertips. Well, I, I was going to add as a corollary to the fact that the distances here are greater. You can also move through them faster because the population density is lower. Um, the roads are wider. Um, you, can, you can speed. I have driven from Land's End to John O'Groats, and I'm here to tell you it's, it's not a day's drive, whereas you can actually drive from Tucson to Flagstaff with no problem at all on the freeway in you know, part of a day. So um, the fact that it's um, you know, a short distance away doesn't mean that the travel time isn't equal to a no. much greater distance. And no, absolutely. And so, yeah, so Fion is, Fion and Leo are driving down single track roads. And I mean single, like there is just enough room for a British car, not an American car, a British mm -hmm. car. Um, you know, if you meet something coming other way, you're reversing half a mile back. There are sheep jumping down onto the streets, onto the road. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a tricky part of the world to police. I'm sure it is. Um, and there's been at least one, if not two, Welsh policing series on, I don't remember, you know, which of the many streaming services, but one of them did a really excellent job with the rural nature of policing in Wales and, you know, the obstacles to, you know, to moving around and doing things. And also, it seemed to me made made the police a little more tolerant. Um, you know, they they um, they weren't so by the book um, with the with the people they were sent to corral or you know yeah. figure out. I mean, it wasn't like they went soft on murder or anything, but they had no more but you, community you do have hmm? Yeah, totally. So the only time I um, I've only ever been a, I was only assaulted once as a, or was injured seriously as a, a police officer once. And it was the very first day that I started in a rural area. So I'd moved from a city and moved from Oxford and I'd gone out to the, the country. And I continued to sort of police in an urban way in, a, in a, an environment that it just didn't suit. And I, it took me a while to get used to the fact that things are different you know in the country you do have to use you know use your common sense a bit more and know you're not doing things by the book because actually if you arrest everybody that does something wrong you've got no more resources for the rest of the night you've you know because you're off two hours away at the police station there are no more police officers so it is very very different absolutely so let's go back to the lake um it's new year's eve and reese has decided to try to create some 
goodwill or acceptance or whatever you want to call it by having a pretty lavish New Year's Eve party on his side of the lake, right? In, um, mm -hmm. in the shore. And that's where we get to meet. You have a very big cast in this, in this book. Um, it's huge. Did you, did and we you, hear from a lot of them. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We definitely do. And also, you know, the, the, it's not a linear story. You know, there, I, it was interesting. I took a look at Goodreads before we started because I always thought it was sort of interesting to see what readers say. And I was surprised by how many people had trouble keeping up with the number of characters, you know, or, or the timeline. Um, I don't even know what a slow burn mystery is because that's not a, 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 a term that I'm familiar with, but many of them called it slow burn. Um, so I'm not a, you know, I'm not a big fan of authors reading reviews. In fact, I think authors shouldn't read reviews, but I was curious um, as to, you know, when you, you've chosen to write a, a, a series, which you haven't done before, you've written several really great standalones, but these characters, apparently this place are interesting enough for you want to, you want to continue them. Uh, but, but I was fascinated with, um, I mean, for me, it was catnip, you know, I loved it. I mean, oh, great, more characters, more motives, you know, more stuff going on. Um, and so I, I'm just, I find it, I'm trying to figure out, to be honest, Claire, I'm trying to figure out what readers are looking for at the moment. I think the oh, pandemic- Oh man, uh, isn't that the perennial question? Yeah. I mean, if we knew that we'd all have, we'd all be writing the flat share or, you know, whatever the next, the next big hit is. Um, the, the, I think the slow burn thing is really interesting because um, I, I, I would say a lot of my books actually are, are slow burn, although I don't like that term. I, I, I like character led crime novels. Mm -hmm. And for me, books that some reviewers would describe as slow burn, for me, they, they're character led. You know, that's and that's why we're not plunging into huge amounts of action right at the beginning. Although, you know, this is a book that starts with a murder investigation. So I don't know how, you know, what what else they they would want at the beginning. But I like as a reader to get to know the characters and I like to see events through different people's eyes and understand them a bit more, you know, and, and, and play around with that perception so that what we think we've seen through one person's eyes is actually very different when we see it. From someone else's um but no I don't read reviews as a matter of course um if I'm if I'm sent one you know if it appears in the paper I'll probably read it um because it's quite important to know if I've been trashed in a newspaper which I haven't yet but there's always a first time um and if a blogger if a book blogger has taken the time to write a review then I will read that but I won't go looking on Amazon um, and I would never read Goodreads reviews. I I, um, I loathe Goodreads. I, I I find it a really unpleasant place to be for a writer. I think it's lovely for readers, and it's great to go there and make your reviews. But it is not a place that an author should be. I agree with you. I think you know those are places for readers, not writers. And it's obvious that some of the people who post things there have created you know little little groups of their own. Um, and the only reason I went there was that I was in a hurry, to be honest, because I suddenly realized I didn't have my arc. And I thought, oh Lord, I'm gonna have to remember the names, you know, help. Um, and so there I was, but but it really caught my eye and I was pondering slow burn. And, um, and I think you're right. I think what, what it is is that if you're introducing people to the characters and there isn't, you know, a bang, bang action right at the very very beginning then maybe the the maybe that's what they mean you know is the action that's the slow burn i was trying to figure out what was burning slowly i guess was yeah. what i was groping for there and i'm going to conclude that maybe it's the action and the pacing starts off at a at a slower rate than if you're slammed into a thriller and you know with the prevalence of of the trust no one in these deep psychological thrillers um, which I keep hoping, frankly, are going to pass um, because I think, like, as is always true, there comes a moment in which there are just too many books that are like each other. I feel the same way about the World War II genre at the moment, women's stories. They're wonderful stories. There are a lot of terrific books, but it's just like there are too many of them. Want to read 
something else. So that's one reason I fall upon your police procedure like a wolf on a sheep, you know. Going, um, yeah, yeah, and I must admit, it is. Ex uh, I'm quite excited about the fact that it's for, for the time being. This is what I'm going to be writing. There are other psychological thrillers that I want to write. There's a couple of standalone sort of high concept twisty thrillers that I've got in mind. But for now, it's the series, and and part of that is because I've I'm just a little bit jaded by the the sort of the compulsion to have a domestic twist setting. Um, I, you know, I, th I think in order to, I've been very fortunate that the psychological thrillers I've written have been well received, well reviewed, um, you know, have sold well, and the twists have worked. I don't know how I don't know how many of those I can write and I don't ever want to get to a point where I'm kind of creating twists for the sake of it because that's that's what the genre demands I, I don't want that and right now I'm really loving the kind of slightly Agatha Christie-esque feel mm -hmm. of a murder a, a classic murder mystery which is basically what the last party is it's what a lot of police, police procedurals are um and with police procedurals you I think you either you either really focus on the police investigation as in you know the forensics the I mean I've just read um Patricia Cornwell's latest and of course that's a very different type of of um thriller but there there, there she's really drilling down into the forensics of course because that's her, her shtick whereas I think what I focus on in um The Last Party is is the suspects it's the you know that there are numerous people who wanted Grease Lloyd dead and who could have done it and the game it's a cat and mouse game not just between the police and the suspect but between me and the readers the game is can you figure out who it is before I tell you and the ideal is that they figure it out a second before I tell them you know a page is is the absolute perfection. So the real questions at the heart of a classic mystery are the who and the why of it. You know, um, I've tried to explain to people that a locked room mystery, uh, which is a, a much rarer form and which has really been misapplied so often recently, the whole point of a locked room mystery is the how of it. It's not, you know, because you know who's dead. Um, and, you know, it's a different thing. There, there's a lot of classic forms uh, in term being tossed around at the moment much of it inappropriately. Um, you know, a country house murder, which is basically just a closed environment where you've got a number of suspects, which is, you know, more or less what you're talking about here. There's only, you know, so many people um, that, that are potential suspects in the situation that you've created. So in its way, it's kind of a, a country house murder. You don't expect somebody <laughs> has flashed up from Durham, you know, to... Too. No, absolutely, absolutely, and and I would always call those a closed cast mystery. Right. So well, you're not you're it's not the same thing. Yeah, you're not looking for a wild card anywhere. You know, the police, of course, are going to say we're keeping an open mind. It could be someone from the outside, but you basically know it's someone on that on that list. And I love reading books like that because you've got as a reader, you're basically ticking them off as you go. You know, have they got the means, the motive, and the opportunity? And a well crafted mystery will kind of tease you with that in that you know that that person will have all three of those and then will take away the opportunity but they've still got the means and the motive and so as the reader you're kind of you should want to make notes that's my you might not want to you might not actually do that but I think you should kind of be trying to fit this puzzle together and almost at the point where you're jotting down everyone's motives and means and, and opportunity. Well, I think I think the classic mystery form, as you're describing, is one that challenges the reader. A, a thriller is basically taking a reader along for a ride. You know, it isn't about the reader figuring it out. Um, it's about the reader rooting for the hero to win. And a thriller depends on a really great, you know, a, a, a bad actor. If you don't yeah. have a sufficiently strong bad actor, then the hero's um, journey and heroics are largely meaningless. 
So yes, and it's also about where the where the crime is, I think. And so for me, mostly, and, and there are books that step outside this, but the mystery, or as we would probably call it in the UK, a, a crime novel or a procedural, the crime has happened at the beginning. And then the book is about unraveling that mystery. Yeah. And there may well be some peril and some thrills at, at the end, but essentially you, you're unpicking what happened at the start. Whereas a thriller is often about stopping something happening. Yeah. So it may well be that the thing that's going to happen is a bigger version of what happens at the beginning. But either way, you've got that kind of ticking clock and everyone is focused on stopping the thing that hasn't yet happened. So the balance of the two books is, is really quite different. They're, they're effectively opposites of each other. Absolutely true. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm never quite sure whether where the psychological thriller which side it, it, it completely falls on. I mean, I've read some that really engage me and I've read some where I think, you know, this is just all about, you know, the twists and, you know, is there going to be another one? But to be, um, let us not leave out the fact that even in um, The Last Party, you can have a twist. You can think you know what's happening and then Claire can trick you uh, just as she has done in her standalone novels. So um, I think part of it may be, Claire, that, you know, I have a logical mind and I like sort of straightforward, you know, I like moving ahead, along with the investigation more than I like spiraling all over the place. But it's also important that, you know, that, I mean, every reader reads a book differently. Um, and so when you're going to write a police procedural, you may be writing it for a somewhat different audience um, who may come along from your other books because of your name. And then they'll either like it or, you know, or it won't quite fit them in the same way that they liked. You're amazing. You came to see us with your first book I, yeah. um, when you were here um, in the States, which I've always been grateful for because we haven't had an opportunity to do this face to face ever since. But that was that was when this kind of book was your that kind of book was um, was fresher. You know, there weren't so many of them. Yeah. So do you know what? That, so I Let You Go came out in 2015, which was the year that The Girl on the Train came out. Um, and so it really was at the start of yeah. what I call the new wave, the new wave of, of psychological suspense, because, of course, we'd had, you know, there are many, many examples predating that. And it was not long after Gone Girl. But I was reading through um, my rejections for that book. So I'd, although I'd found an agent very quickly, the book didn't sell, you know, it was rejected by uh, multiple publishers. And one of the rejections says, um, this book was an uncomfortable mesh up or mash up of women's fiction and police procedural. And I cannot see that that will work. Now, the, you know, the funny thing, of course, is that that is exactly what has worked for years now, that domestic suspense is essentially pulling from the women's fiction genre. Um, you know, I don't like that as a term, but it is what it is. Uh, and, and bringing in a, 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 an element of peril of crime. Um, but it just shows that if, the, if that editor was feeling that, that we weren't, we were just on the, on the kind of the cusp of that happening because that editor was not comfortable yet with the idea that this could be a book that would work. You know, we were submitting in 2013, maybe even the back end of 2012. So Which it was really was, yeah. quite early for that sort of book. Um, whereas if you, you know, you submitted it now, then everyone knows exactly what, what shelf it would sit on. But, you know, it, it is interesting to, to try to anticipate for me, as a bookseller, what's going to be the next big thing that will really grab people? And one of the things I've learned in the pandemic was that the next big thing is actually the old thing, because there's been a real return to classics. Um, you know, the British Library series are, um, are, you know, an example of that. But we're seeing Agatha Christie is having this astonishing um, moment for the last year or two. And it isn't that people are writing Miss Marple, or although there is a phenomenal book called Marple, where a bunch mm. of modern modern authors have written really killer, you know, Jane Marple stories. But but her influence, her forms, her use of classic forms has um, shaped an awful lot of of novels. And you know, I I think at every point a, a genre becomes overblown, and then people, you know, 
you're not quite sure what the new thing is, but there can be a renaissance of, of the old. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And my only fix for that, I think, for me as a writer, is simply to write what I want to write. Yeah. Because I think if I, my my worry would be if I, if I said, well, this is my niche, I write psychological thrillers with big twists, at some point, either the trend would would uh, tail away or I wouldn't be able to think of a psychological thriller with a big twist or you know I would be so far down that niche that it would be really difficult to pivot to something else whereas actually just by focusing on stories that you know surprise and engage and entertain so far I've been able to write lots of different books including a book that isn't crime at all you know a, a family drama after the end that fits in and has the same readers simply because it's about a, a bunch of ordinary people in a moment of crisis and although that crisis happens in that book not to be a crime and and to be a medical drama it kind of doesn't matter because it still fits with my style of writing so as long as readers want to read the sorts of things I write I'm not going to worry too much about what genre they are why did you decide to to make this a series did you decide before you started it or did you get so engaged with the characters you thought you had more to say about them? If I had decided before I wrote the book, I would have been much more organized about how, how I approached the series and who was going to be in it and who would stay and who would go. And the fact that maybe I wouldn't have sort of nothing around this town for an hour because now it's really logistically difficult when I want them to pop to the station. Um, no, I felt that um that there aren't very many books set in Wales there aren't enough when you compare it to say Scottish crime uh, or any other part of the UK and there particularly aren't very many set in North Wales which is a very very specific type of, of place um and so I felt that I I was writing about somewhere that wasn't being written about very much and that I had created a fictional setting with this this cross-border world this sort of community tension that was rich territory for more stories but what really sort of clinched it for me was was Fionn who just demanded more and I felt that I I didn't want to I, I've never written a police character that I've wanted to come back to and series have got to be police characters really or journalists or uh, social workers you know they've, they've got to be professionals because you can't really put an ordinary member of the public through repeated trauma after trauma you know they can't be a series character it would be grossly unfair to do that so I've never written a police character where I felt there was just sort of enough about them that they had um, a different way of looking at the world perhaps uh, that would carry a series and then I started writing Fionn and she kind of took over and I wrote to my editor in the UK and I said I think I might be writing a series and my <laughs> editor wrote back and said well I'll decide that actually <laughs> in slightly nicer terms but you know that's that's the way it goes isn't it the the author might want to write a series but someone's got to want to publish it but then when she read the last party she said yeah I, you know I think readers are going to love Fionn and I love her and I want to hear more so um for the time being so certainly my my next two books um are Fionn books and then you know who knows we'll see what readers think you know to be to really do your best um in, to reach your public and the whole bit you have to be in love with what you're doing and if you're bored um we'll be bored so you know three books sounds like a wonderful thing and if you felt like you said, if you then feel like you said everything you want to say about Fionn, um, you can always, because you're right, you haven't trapped yourself in a series so that you can't dig out of it, yeah. nor have you trapped yourself in a particular genre. Um, I shouldn't say trap. Let me say embedded. I think that's a much better word. You embedded to, is a good way. But I think also there are different ways of approaching series, aren't there? And I... Um, I am not setting out to write the sort of series where there is an overarching story where Fionn is sort of, you know, wrestling with an ongoing problem or searching for a missing husband or whatever it is over a period of books. That's not the sort of series that I'm writing. And, and actually, I have huge admiration for authors who can do that. 
who can handle not just the narrative arc in the individual book that they're writing, but also a wider arc over a dozen or more books. What I want to write is a series where we're in the same world, we're with some of the same characters, but not always, um, always Fionn, but that you can read any one of them on its own. You know, it reads as a standalone. You, yes, there are kind of Easter eggs if you happen to have read other books in the series, but I want it to absolutely stand up as a straightforward crime novel because as a reader, I'm, I'm quite lazy. And if I come across a book that sounds brilliant, but it's number 11 in the series, I need to be convinced about reading it. I need to know that I'm not going to have to read all the others. I might want to read the other 10 books, but I might not be able to, I might not have time to read another 10 books. So I don't want that for my series. I want it to be uh, sort of accessible, I suppose. And if you've chosen a policewoman, as you have, um, the truth is police work is like that. You know, it's a series of cases um, and you move along. Actually, most of the time, police personnel are working multiple cases. They're not working just a single case. And, you know, I'm going to be talking to Michael Connolly tomorrow night. And, you know, Harry Bosch has been on a quest by this particular case. It's like, you know, haunted him throughout his career and all. But I don't know that they're, that's often true. I mean, I expect for many police, uh, police men and women that there is a case or more than one case they wish they could have solved or, you know, wish it had come out differently. But the idea that you, you know, maybe over 30 years would be pursuing one killer or something, um, I think is somewhat improbable. Um, it but, is, yeah. but you know what? We are writers of fiction, so I think right. we'll, we'll allow the artistic license. So going back to the last party, because I always wind up getting digressing away from the actual story that we're talking about. Um, who is the, who? Is it, do you want to talk about who it is that bobs up dead in the lake? Um, or do you want the reader to find out? Yeah, he... no, no, we can, we can absolutely talk about that. You know, it's fairly, uh, it's established fairly early on. Right. So we mentioned earlier in our conversation that uh, Reese Lloyd, this homegrown singer has come back and instead of putting his money in his own community, he's, he's put it over the other side of the lake in this um, patch of land that he owned that is now in England. Um, and Reese has this party, which, as you quite rightly said, is kind of sort of ostensibly to build bridges between the two communities, but is really about showing off. Um, and it's all great uh, until um, round about midnight when he dies, when he's murdered. Um, so we join the story on New Year's Day. At the edge of the lake, when the locals are going into the water for their annual swim and Reese's body floats through the lake having sort of floated from the the English side to the Welsh side and that's the the sort of what kickstarts this cross-border investigation so he is dead um and it's fairly swiftly established that um he oh no I was going to spoil something then it wasn't nothing nothing swiftly established at all I can't say anything forget I said anything um he he's dead and Fionn and Leo uh go to the post-mortem and uh, um, and the pathologist who does his post-mortem is one of my favorite characters oh. Izzy Weaver and she only has about four pages um, but I love her so much that I'm having to put her in the next book um, even though I don't really need to be at a post-mortem just because she's really fun. Well why not I mean you know there are many police procedurals where a pathologist is an integral part you know look yeah. at um wasn't Morris, but Sergeant Lewis, um, you know, uh, the pathologist, in fact, becomes um, becomes his partner. So, you know, I think it's a good working really. The French are really big that way. We've watched an inordinate amount of French um, mystery over the course of the pandemic. And the pathologist and is, is right there all the time. Plus the state prosecutor, you know, it's never. Yeah, just they a, have the, the the magistrate in France direct right. the police investigation, don't they? It's um, it's a completely different way of of working. My father was a pathologist, um, and when I was uh quite young, I used to go I used to go to work with him, not very often, um, but if I was ill off school and for some reason my mum couldn't have me, I would go into work, 
and uh, you know nowadays that just it wouldn't happen and there would be all sorts of PPE and and rules and regulations but I was just allowed to just sort of sit on another slab while he did his thing um and it was which is fascinating I learned so much from him um and uh definitely picked up some of the sort of black humor that a lot of pathologists and a lot of police officers have um and there's quite a bit of that I think in in the last party sort of um quite quite fast quite funny dialogue um hopefully funny between Leo and and Fionn oh there is absolutely so and you know unfortunately there are a lot of people who wanted Reese dead so you know it's not going to be a straightforward investigation um, and it will take you into corners of people's lives. It's really a very rich setting. Um, and I enjoyed it very much. So why don't we call Ian up to see if we have any comments or questions from the audience? Hello there, Ian. Hello. We actually do have some questions. The first question for Claire is, have you done any more quick reads other than the donor? No, I haven't. I don't think. I um, generally speaking, authors just do one quick read. So the quick reads is a project run by the Reading Agency, which is a UK charity which promotes literacy. And they do this specific project called Quick Reads, which is a, uh, a novel that's a quarter of the length of a full novel. So it's about 20,000 words. And they're all written by best selling authors. And the brief is really interesting. So the, the aim of the novel is to make it accessible. And so they're given to, um, they're, they're very affordable. They're, they're a pound or a dollar to buy. And they are um, particularly aimed at people who are perhaps learning English as a second language or have um, a learning to read as an adult, or perhaps they've been ill um, and they're struggling with concentration. Um, so all sorts of reasons. I found them when I was... Um, I just had a baby and I couldn't concentrate and, and I read these shorter books. So when you write them, you have to really focus on the main story, strip out subplots, keep the characters to around about three, four, maybe five at the most. You go through a, a literacy edit where your editor will sort of gently say, do you really need to be using that very, very long word? You know, is there a, a more straightforward way you can say it? without being patronizing, without talking down to people, we're constantly reminded that um, just because someone can't read very well doesn't mean they can't think very well. And so it's getting the balance right. It was a real, I, I loved it, loved writing it. Um, and I would absolutely write another one, but generally speaking, each year they choose uh, five or six different authors to, to do them. Very good. Next question. Why, in your opinion, is a story set in a small town always so fascinating? Do you think that this kind of location and a small circle of characters create much more intimacy for the readers? Yes, good question. Mm -hmm. I Yeah, so there are sort of two elements of that, aren't there? I think this, the second half is exactly what Barbara and I were saying earlier, that that sort of closed cast does definitely up the tension um, and often up the stakes because if you've got a bunch of strangers together there's not such a there's, it's not kind of um such emotion between them it, it's maybe it matters less you know if someone's killed for money for example whereas if you've got a group of people who know each other uh, who live together then I think this, the emotional stakes are higher uh, the the thing I find endlessly fascinating about small towns as, as a reader or a viewer or a writer is the way that people don't grow up properly. So I so I notice this when I go back to my mother's with my two sisters. It's like I regress. It's like I sort of emotionally go back to being a teenager. Um, and, you know, we'll kind of bicker a little bit or we'll just I'll just behave in a different way because there's something about that setting that that sort of puts you right back there and so if you've grown up in a small town and everyone who knew you as a, a kid or a teenager is still there it's really hard for them to see you as anything other than the teenager that you were at that point and and 
in the last party, this is what happens to, to Fion, who lived there and was known as Fion Wished, so Wild Fion, when she was a teenager. Nicknames are used a lot in, in Wales because surnames, there aren't very many Welsh surnames, so a lot of people tend to have the same name and generally people will use their middle names or nicknames to kind of distinguish. Anyway, so Fion was Fion Wished, and she kind of, she hasn't really shaken it off. Um, so I think that's really interesting. People can get stereotyped. And it's one of those environments where you think you know everything about everyone, but people are kind of clinging on to a secret. It's a yeah, rich territory for a writer. But don't you think that that's also true, or part of what motivates Reese is that, you know, he grew up there and everybody knew his history. And then he went away and became somebody different. And he did want to come back to flaunt it in many respects. Um, so how, you know, is part of the story um, what he was like? I'm not asking you to answer this, but, you know, what he was like when he lived there. Uh, because I think many people, you know, it's that high school reunion thing where, you know, you go away and then, you know, you want to you have plastic surgery and dye your hair and, you know, buy Chanel or whatever it might be to go back and say, look, you know, I'm not I'm not the person I was in high school. Look how I have evolved. But then other people are still the people they were in high school. It's all very different. Definitely. Yes. All of that. It's all fascinating. Another question. What's your personal relationship with social media? Does social media increase the success of your books or the love for reading in general? Oh, I think I can answer the first part of that question and not, I don't know, I'd have to think about the second. Um, I, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with social media. I would quite like to not be doing it, but I feel, I. I I just don't think I can stop um, because I genuinely like engaging with readers. I really like knowing what readers are, writing, are reading, you know, what um, what they've discovered. And I, yeah, I just, I like chatting to them, but it's really time consuming and it can be quite intrusive, I suppose, um, you know, quite all, all consuming and really, my job is to write books um so I, I sometimes I haven't got the, the balance right does it sell books I I don't honestly know I think it's more for me I look at it more as um sort of cementing the relationship I have with my readers I think readers nowadays want a more three-dimensional experience from reading they don't just want to open the book and read the words they want to they want the kind of the the um the director's cut DVD, you know, that used to come with a box set. They want the interviews with the producer and the actors and they want the outtakes, the deleted scenes, the, uh, you know, the making of. And that's what they get from uh, authors social media. Um, so I, you know, I quite enjoy that. And I do feel like it's very much part of the job now. Um, yeah. But whether we'll still be on Twitter and a month's time who knows <laughs> absolutely true but you're right about you know the communication you you basically foster a reading community but it is terribly hard to get the time balance right and honestly with you know you can look at colleen hoover and say okay you know book talk really sells books but i'm not convinced that instagram and twitter and all are really that effective i honestly don't know no, I don't think so from a kind of an individual point of view. You know, I don't think it would make any difference to my sales, for example, if I said, right, I'm not doing Instagram or Twitter. Um, Facebook, for me, for me, if, if I had to pick one, I would stay on Facebook and lose everything else. Because what I have on Facebook is my book club. So I have a, a Facebook a uh, group, the Claire McIntosh Book Club. Uh, there are about 9,000 of us in the group um, and a big um, email mailing list as well. And we read uh, a different book each month. You know, it's, it's kind of optional. People read it or they don't. And um, I set some questions. We talk about it. And in between times, everyone's recommending books, talking about books, sharing book memes. You know, it's a nice, it's a really, really friendly part of the internet and that's the one that I would keep and ignore everything else 
I don't know if it sells my books. It's it's not it's not really sort of why I do it. I do it because I love books and I love talking to people about what they're reading. But I think it definitely encourages people to buy them and perhaps encourages people to say buy the hardback rather than wait for the paperback or buy from an indie because they're going to get it signed rather than buy from Amazon um, or they might buy it earlier than, than they than they would otherwise. So I think it's that sort of effect rather than uh, straightforward sales. And a corollary to that is you have to be your best self if you're going to be on social media because there's no point in going out there and pissing off everybody and yeah. having a negative effect, right? Absolutely that. Yes, I'm very careful. I, I, never, I never tweet drunk ever. <laughs> Right. Anything else, Ian? Yes. Another question. Will Leo be in the series? Yes, he will. But this is this sort of comes back to what I said earlier about if I'd planned to do a series, <laughs> I would have thought more about it because there is a limit to how many cross-border investigations that can happen, you know, along this one border in this particular part of the world. Um, and I did I sort of struggled with that and what I was going to do and then the answer has has presented itself to me so he will stay and in fact in book two it's very similar in that there is a cross-border investigation they're, they're slightly um uh, north they've um there there's a a murder that happens on the mountain that um kind of crosses both both parts of the the border both sides of the border and so book two is has a sort of similar um set up I suppose uh, but by the end of book two Leo will have moved into a slightly different role in Theon's life and so he doesn't necessarily have to be the opposite police officer he will still be there very much part of the story um, but not necessarily as as her oppo and finally who is publishing your book oh um, I've never asked practical questions like that. Who is publishing my books? In the UK, I'm published by an imprint called Sphere, which is part of Little Brown, which is in turn part of Hachette. Um, and in the US, I'm published by Sourcebooks, um, who I just adore. I have never felt so passionate about a publisher. They are so creative and uh, nimble and they're doing such a brilliant job with my books um, so that is where you'll find the last party and hopefully my next books too well i hope so too and you will find copies of them at the poison pen um which we are um very pleased as i mentioned when we started all this is our british crime book of the month which means that the people who belong to that club have to take whatever I pick out for them <laughs> ship it off um so I work very hard at um not only finding well-written books but um a variety of books so they don't get you know the same thing over and over again and my hope my hope is that um partly people join it to discover things that they might you know not necessarily read on their own. And one reason I picked Claire's book this month is that it's different than her other books. It is a police procedural, but I love the, the, um, the Welsh English um, because I, as she said earlier, there are a lot of books published in Scotland. There's lots of crime fiction with a Scottish background. There's loads and loads of British crime fiction. There's even Irish crime fiction, but there's, there's very little that seems to originate in Wales. So, you know, Yay. It's great. Anyway, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Clara, it's wonderful to see you again. Maybe with your next book, you'll come, come back to the States. I am going to make it a priority. Barbara, thank you so much. As always, I really appreciate your support. Not at all. I really enjoy it. Thank you indeed. Bye, everybody. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.